Well, thank you all for coming. Yes. I uh, have been on the road for a couple weeks. We've been filming a show. We just got back from Louisiana. We were in Shreveport. And if anybody's a True Blood fan, does anybody here watch True Blood? Yeah. Two people? <laughs> me and her. Me and her. So they film a lot of True Blood in Shreveport, and I didn't even know that. So it was kind of cool going to all those haunts and stuff, you know. And I was like, oh, this looks familiar. So it was really fun. But we fought really hard for our schedule. We have two weeks on, two weeks off. And I was just telling these guys earlier, uh, when we first started filming the show season one, we had like eight weeks on the road, four days off, six weeks on the road. Maybe we were home for a week and we were just like wanting to kill each other, you know. And with that, we, we, uh, we've been very blessed with our crew. Um, we have a lot of people that have been with us since the beginning, which is very unusual because uh, in television, they're always rotating people. Basically, people are like, uh, independent contractors so you have your cameraman your sound man your directors everybody just kind of works for themselves and they go from gig to gig to gig so we finally got a cameraman and a sound man and uh, there's a couple people that have been with me for three and a half years I don't know what their title is or what they do but they do a good job of it and that's why they're there and uh, we finally got a crew that's a really solid crew really just understands the process, gets the project, and they're just so passionate, and everybody has become a picker. So my cameraman's always put the camera down, I'm like, John, stop picking, please, let's just get this. We call it DT, downtime, so like, enough DT. So um, everybody's picking, and everybody's got their own vibe of what they're looking for, and it's really cool to see just how they've evolved as far as their picking capabilities in regards to um, what they think is cool, why they like it. Like John's really into World War II stuff, and um, and uh, we've got a couple girls on the crew that are into lighting and vintage clothing and stuff like that. And um, the rule is though, they have to ask us first. And they're like, "You're not gonna buy this, are you?" <laughs> well, I was, but I see if I do, then I'm gonna be in trouble. <laughs> so, but um, I think the show resonates with a lot of people because it's really about all of us. It's about everybody, you know. It, uh, it's about anybody that wants to scratch a lottery ticket or go to an estate sale or go to a yard sale or or uh, or just kind of gamble on themselves, I think, is what you can say. And I think that's why the show resonates with so many people. And. I don't know if of you. I don't know if a lot of you know this, but I pitched this show for four and a half years, long time, and, and uh, just lots of days and nights on the road. And what you see me do on the show is what I've done for 25 years, and it was uh, it was a long road getting the show. And then finally, History Channel gave us a shot. They got a new uh, president. Her name's Nancy Dubuque, and she's incredible. She's actually president of Lifetime now. She's president of A and E, and she's president of History. So she's very talented. She's the one uh, that did Hatfields and McCoys, the Bible, the Vikings, I mean, all these shows that are setting records. She's the one who's created a lot of that stuff and bought it and understood it and realized there was a market for it. She bought us, she bought Pawn Stars, um, and American Restoration, a lot of the shows you see on there, and just kind of took the, the network in a different direction. And when she saw our stuff, uh, she looked at it, and what I'd been trying to do for four and a half years was basically get a pilot for the show and a pilot is, is really a proof of concept, meaning, okay, this looks great on paper, this is incredible, but can you really do this? Can you do what you say you can do? So that's what we were trying to do, is get a pilot. So when she initially looked at the project, she saw footage that I had shot, and uh, she's like, give me 10 <coughs> episodes. So it was the first time history had ever bought a show without a pilot, which is a huge honor. But as the show progressed, and uh, I remember the first day the show aired, uh, I came to work the next day at the shop, and I had 6,000 emails. <laughs> and I was sitting there trying to answer them all. And Danielle's like, what are you doing? I'm like, kidding me? There's good leads in here. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, went, I, got, I think I got like maybe 250 answered and, and all day, you know? And, um, and there was a lot of people coming by the store. We didn't even have cash register. All, my whole business was uh, internet-based. I bought for certain clients, and um, you know, it, we didn't do anything with retail. So when people started coming by the store, Danielle was losing her mind, and I said, just go to Staples and buy the cheapest cash register they have. So it, yeah, Scarbox, yeah. 
And I think we still have the $75 cash register is what we use at our Iowa store. But one thing that happened during that time period was we started getting so much mail from children and and uh, and families were coming in the store and it's like, oh, you know, it's really cool to watch the show. It's a show that we can watch together. And, um, and that started resonating with me and, and kids would come in with stuff they found and they would write letters and send pictures and everything. And I was just like, God, this just reminds me so much of when I was a kid, when I was doing this, I started at four, you know, digging in the garbage all the time. And, um, and they just inspired me so much because the show is the hardest thing I've ever done. I mean, Frank and I, neither of us have ever been on camera before. You know, we just totally just be ourselves. I mean, um, you know, I've known the guy since eighth grade and I've known Danielle for 16 years. And I think that really resonates and translates really well on camera. And I think that's one of the reasons why the show does well, but we're very passionate about what we do. I actually get teased on a lot of uh, like talk shows and stuff about how passionate I am and crazy and excited I get over the smallest things. But you know, that's all part of being like a big kid. You know, I think we're all born as pickers because we all have that sense of curiosity, adventure, wanting to discover but as we get older, we kind of lose some of that because we have obligations. You know, we have mortgages and we have car payments and we raise children and we have all these things going on in our lives. We still have that picker bug in us, but there's so many, there's so many different layers to it then. But when a child sees something and they have such a young, vulnerable, um, clever eye, you know, I used to watch kids at flea markets when Frank and I would set up at flea markets and the, markets and the things they would pick up it's just so so cool, and I would ask them, "Why did you pick that up? Why do you like that? You know, what what appeals to you about that?" And they would this this the, the simple way that they would explain themselves uh, to me of, of what they cared about the item was was incredible. And what this book is about first the first thing people think is, "Oh, you know, how can kids make money?" That kind of thing. Well, that, the book is really not about that at all. I mean, there's a little bit touches base a little bit with that, but it's it's helping children understand what they're doing. Because when I was a kid, you know, I always wanted to be down by the railroad tracks or at the junkyard or there we had a swimming hole called Mossy Point and just finding stuff in the creek, you know, that had washed down there over the years. And it was almost kind of an isolating experience for me, you know, because I had friends that were in wrestling or soccer or football and stuff. And so I spent a lot of this time by myself doing these things. And a lot of the things that I found became my toys, you know, when I was a kid. I'd find something and you know, you recreate possibly in your mind where it came from and who owned it and how it got there and, you know, uh, the life it had before me. And so I was constantly doing that all the time. And then when I got all these letters from these kids, I was like, well, I wasn't, I wasn't the only one that felt that way. And when kids see the show, the, the show they see it as this huge treasure hunt, which I think is incredible. And um, it's such an honor for so many kids that watch the show. So... I started talking to a friend of mine, Lily Sp Springlemeyer. I just love saying her name, Lily Springlemeyer. <laughs> and she's from Dubuque, Iowa. She teaches there in third grade. And uh, I remember her when she was eight years old. She was a tiny little thing. And she was always in her father's antique shop. And her father and I did a lot of business together. I would sell him stuff and buy things from him when I was going through town. And um, I remember her in the shop, and then later in life, about three years ago, we connected again. I just saw her from mutual friends. I'm like, you're Lily? And she's like, yeah, I hadn't seen her since she was so small. And I said, you know, I started talking to her about the show, and, and uh, I said, I'm going to write this children's book. All these kids have inspired me to write this book. And she goes, I wrote a children's book. And I go, you did? And she goes, well, it's never published, but I wrote it for school when I, when I went to the University of Iowa. And I said, I'd love to read it. And I read it and just, oh my God, I just started crying, you know. She was so incredible, so sensitive and really cool. And um, it was about a young boy that his grandfather had passed away. And uh, they were cleaning out his house. And um, his grandmother was kind of like distributing things to the kids of what he wanted them to have. And he gave this boy, she gave them to her grandson a cigar box and in that there was like a piece of a baseball skin and a ticket stub and a piece of a dress and things like that. He started crying. He's like, why did grandpa, why was grandpa so mad at, well, what did I do wrong? Why did he leave me this? And then um, her, the grandmother explained to him how all of these things are so important. You know, each one of those things was so important. So he actually got the most, the, the most amazing gift of all. So when I read that, I was like, she is perfect for this because she understands it like I do. 
And um, so we it was two years in the making with this book. And I think about how blessed we are. You know, what's the difference between me and anybody else out there other than I had an idea and I was persistent about it. There's nothing any different than us, but we are so blessed because we have viewership that's incredible and people understand what I'm trying to do. Like the whole time I was pitching the show, it was, it was, I wanted to show the relationship that people have with items. You know, why does this guy have 300 gas pumps? You know, I mean, I know you worked at a gas station when you were 15, but why do you have 300 <laughs> gas pumps? You know, I mean, it was just amazing to me. And, and I'm like, why do I have 45 motorcycles? <laughs> you know, I like to ride motorcycles, but can I ride 45 of them? No, I can't. But there's certain things that I appreciate about each one. So I wanted to show the relationship that people have with items, and I wanted to, uh, to show that these things still exist and that people can find things. And I remember when I was pitching uh, the show, this one guy was like, well, you're never going to find enough stuff to make a show. I was like, are you kidding me? There's so much stuff out there. Because what the perception that people had of antiques prior to us was very elitist. You know, it was the antique road show, and there was a Fabergé egg and a Mona Lisa painting and all of these incredible things. Things that you, it was an incredible, it was an awesome education to watch the show, but it was nothing we would ever find. Nothing any of us would ever find in our lifetime. And, and like, and actually doing this for a living, those aren't the deals that keep you alive anyway. It's to buying the thing for 20 and selling it for 50 or buying something for 10 and selling it for 25. Those are the deals that keep you alive, you know, and keep you in business. So um, I was looking at what was out there, and, and uh, I thought, God, you know, like on the road show, they would just have somebody, oh, this was my uncle's clock, and it sat on his mantle, and, you know, every day at 3 o'clock, he would stop it and light a cigar, and he never told me why, but he would do that. You know, why can't I hear that from the uncle, I thought? Why can't I see it on his mantle? You know, why can't we experience that? as a nation and it's, it's, it's the viewer seeing that thing and seeing that story unfold and that's what I wanted to do and a lot of times we'll roll up onto people's properties now and they're like I don't know if I have anything for you here and I'm like well here's the deal you know it's like I'm just here to tell your story if we find something that's great but <coughs> just think of it that way and help me do that you know because it's the character it's the history and the stuff to us is last because to me, you know, people come up here like, oh, I love the Mole Man, or I love Hobo Jack, or I love Hippie Tom, you know, and they just go on and on, but, but they could never tell me what I bought from any of those people, which to me is an honor, because they're paying attention to the person, and they're paying attention to the story, and not necessarily just about the item, you know? I mean, we've made shows before where I just bought an item for 200 bucks, you know? So it's very character-driven, and if you look at anything else out there, um, it's, it's all hanging their hat on what is what something's worth. You know, what is this worth? You know, that's not what this book is about. What is something worth? There's something in here that touches base on that, but the biggest thing for me is helping kids understand that they can learn about their family's history through these items that they find. They can learn about their community's history through the items they find. And it's so important anymore for children to have take pride in their community. You know, we travel the back roads, lots of windshield time, and we go into a lot of these small towns, and small town America, rural America is disappearing. It's disappearing before your eyes so fast that you can't even imagine. You know, machinery has changed, the agriculture industry has taken jobs away, light industry is gone in communities, jobs are overseas. I mean, we go into towns now, and they don't even bother tearing the buildings down because the, the city has no money to tear the buildings down. So it's just the roofs that caved in, and the buildings start going. And, um, we picked a place in Arkansas, and this gentleman was in this town, and uh, he was in his early 80s, and his wife, he was a mayor of the town for 30 years, and his wife was a president of the bank for 50 years. They had a lot of roots in this community, and he was telling me the whole time I was there, he's like, you will not believe this town, because when I was a kid, the streets were packed, because you couldn't even walk on the sidewalk. And he goes, the straw that broke the camel's back with us was, with us was two years ago where um, we lost our high school. So now the, the families that are still there, the kids have to ride the bus 25 miles one way to school. 50 miles these kids ride each day to get their education. So kids, the families are moving out left and right. So 
he, it, people were uh, starting to notice that we were filming there and the street filled up and he looked out the window and he goes, look at that. He goes, there's people in the street in my town again. And I was like, wow. And he goes, imagine outliving everyone you know. He goes, there's a lot of people that do that, but imagine outliving your town, your community. He goes, this town is gone. There's nothing we can do to save this town. And I thought about that. I'm like, God, what can we do? What can we do for communities like this? You know, we can't save everyone. And I think a lot of it resonates from, like, children understanding if they take pride in their community at an early age, then maybe they'll stay. Maybe when they go to college, they'll leave, and then they'll come back, and they'll open a business or do whatever they want to in this community. But if they don't take pride in their community and they don't learn the history of their community, then it's lost. I think we teach history backwards. You know, everybody knows what's going on in Romania when they're in eighth grade. And they know world history and they, world, they learn national history, but they don't learn anything about their own community. And that's what this book teaches is when kids find things. Because me, I was full on ADHD. I mean, you probably, if you watch me on television, you probably all know that. <laughs> I mean, I have so many thoughts going through my mind at one time. It's crazy. But, um, see, it's happening right now. <laughs> but with what's important is that children take, they learn history in different ways. Everybody learns differently. Like me, it was always hands-on, or I had to use flashcards. I would have to read something over and over and over again. And after I read it over and over and over again, I still didn't get it, so I would make myself flashcards. Sometimes, like even the first chapter of this book, I'd have 25 flashcards on one chapter, and I would just memorize those constantly for me to learn. And each child is different, but I think what's not different about each child is the hands-on part the sense of curiosity to want to discover and the adventure of it. So like Lily is great, she's a third grade teacher now, and she teaches this way. She'll even bring her banjo to school, and she'll make up songs about what they're, what they're uh, learning that day, and she'll bring things that she collects, and things from the community, as far as photographs she gets from the library and stuff, and, and she helps kids understand what happened in their community, how they got to where they are now, and, and it's, it's just such a cool thing. And um, so when we decided to do this book, it was a long road, and we tried to decide what's important to put in the first book, because I want to do a series of books with kids. We, don't have, we, we can't say it all in one book. You know, there's no way to say it all. But um, another thing that it helps children understand is don't feel intimidated. You know, people throw that word antique around, and they're like, oh my gosh, I don't know what this is worth, and you know, this could be something good, and maybe not, I don't know if I should buy it. And, things like that, I always tell people, I'm like, don't worry about that kind of stuff. Don't worry if it's an antique. Just buy something if you like it. If it's in your means to buy it, then buy it if you like it. If it's important to you, then it's going to be important to you, you know? And that's what I want kids to understand. And when it was funny, when I was pitching the show for so long, I was pitching the show under the name Antique Archaeology, the name of my business, and um, a couple of television executives said to me, they're like, in the early on in the process, they're like, lose the word antique. Because if you have it on your reel, nobody's even going to watch your reel. I'm like, wow, what can we call it? You know. So I came up with the words uh, American Picker. And I picked Italy in 2001 with a buddy of mine. And we were the American Pickers. I met English Pickers and French Pickers and Italian Pickers. You know, we, They were surprised that we were there. <laughs> like, what are you guys doing here? I'm like, I'm doing the same thing you are. You know? and, but um, I realized then it's the same all over the world. Very detailed. That's how I always say on the show. It's like the universal language of junk. And um, I don't know if anybody's got a chance to look through the book, but it's very simple to read, and it's very direct, and it's very honest. And there's a lot of very vulnerable moments in there where I read a couple pages of it, and I just like broke into tears. You know, my brother read it for the first time, and he cried. He's like, "Oh my God, this is so great!" Because um, Lily. Yes. Oh my god, I love that show. It's like the 2020 of kids. Like kids would interview kids. You know, they're like, we're going to Connecticut. Tommy's building a boat out of milk jugs. And he's gonna he's gonna sail it today, you know. And then they tell Tommy's story of I don't know why he built a boat out of milk jugs, I guess because he wanted to. So I was always trying to get on Zoom, and I was always trying to get in the uh, Guinness Book of World Records. Like I found a wheelchair in a junkyard one time, and I think I was like in seventh or eighth grade, and 
I was like, I'm going to do the world's longest wheelchair wheelie. So all summer long, everywhere I went, I was wheelchair wheelie, and all my friends would follow me on their bicycles. And I was like, oh man, this is, I was spinning around on it. I was, oh, I was rocking this thing. And then I went to my grandma's in Colorado and I came back and my wheelchair was all bent to hell. The wheels looked like potato chips. Everybody took it over ramps and stuff. And I was so devastated. I was like my dream of being on Zoom and, and uh, you know, being in the world records was crushed. So I was always weird. But, um, but I've always had an eye for things. You know, I never, I mean, I was always kind of well read with, in regards to certain subjects with things that I collected, but it was all about your eye and your gut and, and your, the emotion of it and standing back and taking something in and understanding it beyond you. If you weren't going to keep it, you have to understand it beyond you. So there's a little bit of that in the book as well, too. I can't tell you everything in the book because then you wouldn't even buy it. I know there's a couple people who are videotaping here. <laughs> selling DVDs or something. <laughs> but uh, I appreciate you guys all coming out. It's an honor to be in each one of your living rooms. I know you don't even have to get up anymore and turn the channel. All you got to do is push a button. <laughs> so believe me, we understand that. And uh, we try to make the best show we can all the time. Did you ever pick New Jersey? I used to pick New Jersey all the time. Because uh, I was telling uh, some people that worked here earlier, I uh, stayed in Barnegat all the time. My buddy Jersey John that was on the show, I would ride his couch every night, man. And see, what you see Danielle do on the show is what I used to do. I used to do everything. There was no Danielle, there was no Frank. Basically, uh, I would research my trip and then I would leave to come out to New Jersey and I'd have like five or six places that I was gonna go. And so I would stay at John's house and he would go with me because he could navigate the area and, and um, you know, help me carry stuff, you know, things like that. He would buy different things than I was buying. So it worked out really well. So every morning I would get up and here's my rent. I would get up about 6.30, go down to the Wawa, <laughs> get two pound of coffees and a couple bagels and bring them to John before he even got out of bed. I'm like, here you go, dude. Here's your coffee, here's your bagel. And then he'd be like, where are we going today? I'd be like, we are going to blah, blah, blah. And he's like, okay, let's go. So I would be on the road, and I would stay in New Jersey a lot, and there's so much, it's, it's funny where we're from, Every, when you say New Jersey, everybody thinks, oh my God, it's like a big city, but they don't realize how rural it is, you know, it's so beautiful, and, and um, when I first started heading out to the East Coast years ago, I came out, I was locating motorcycles for different museums, and the first time I ever came to the East Coast, past Ohio, I remember, I was like, I'm going past Ohio, <laughs> was to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. And man, I was driving through the mountains and the tunnels and everything. I was like, God, this is the holy land of Pickens, man. This is where everything is. This is it. This is like the Wild West out here. Pickens, everything is here. It's incredible. And then I really made my living on the East Coast, you know, 10 years prior to the show even. So um, spent a lot of time in New Jersey, quite a bit. And uh, I love, love it around Lambertville and New Hope. Yes. It's yes. so pretty, you know. And people are so nice. And, and I've uh, been very fortunate. Does anybody else have any more questions? Can you pick my mom's basement? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody just asked me that. Thank you for earlier. years. <laughs> yeah, send us an email. Um, <laughs> when did you and Frank start picking together? Well, Frank and I always pick together, but the thing is, with Frank, he always had a job, and I'm the opposite friend of any other friend. Imagine your friend going, you need to quit your job, man. <laughs> job for it. Quit it. Quit your job. And uh, so, finally, after selling the show, then he ended up quitting his job, but uh, we would pick on the weekends and stuff together like we would do. So we're, we're really centrally located in Iowa. In an hour and a half, I could be in Wisconsin. In two minutes, I could be in Illinois. In two hours, I could be in Missouri. In two hours, I could be in Minnesota. You know, well, actually, you know, four hours in Minnesota. So we were really centrally located. So like when I was home, if I was home for three or four days, I would just be like, Frankie, let's hit the road, man. You know, and we'd take off and we'd just pick gravel roads. We'd drive, I remember we'd drive as far as we could in a day, you know, with some decent light left. Maybe we'd drive to like five or six at night and then we would just pick an exit. It's like, let's get off here, man. And which way you wanna go, left or right? And we would go left or right and we'd just start hitting gravel roads and and just, it was great, you know? It was, it was magical. Um, on 
the show, like, on um, those side things, like, the bets and all that stuff, is that, like, real, or are you just doing that for the TV? Bet and prank? Oh, my God, his whole life's a bet. We <laughs> <laughs> bet all the time. We bet all the time, but it's, yeah, no, it's not, if you ever notice, it's not for a lot of money. I think one time we bet $100, that was the highest we've ever bet. Yeah. <laughs> Have you ever been with a kid? Pick what? With a kid. With a kid? Yeah, did you see that show where my nephew, Risa, came with us? Yeah, Risa, he was, how old was he then? He was probably 10, 10 yeah, at least 14 now. He's big now. Risa, that kid you saw on the show, barely too much to be on the Six show. 6'2". You know, where I, I've been self-employed for 26 years, so I've always had something going on. You know, I've had a number of businesses and, uh, and antique archaeology. I started calling it that in 2001. After so many years of doing it, I thought, God, I put, put, put a name on this, you know. So um, this was a project that was near and dear to me, and it was, it, this is a project that I've done on my own. Believe it or not, I can do things without Frank. <laughs> but it's great, though, that, that uh, people ask that, because it's cool that, because uh, a lot of people feel like they know us, and they really do, man. I mean, we're just really the same. Have you or Frank got seriously injured on one of your picks when you were um, I tore my ACL on a pick one time in upstate New York, up by uh, Dansville, New York it was in. And um, this guy had this, I, I've been talking to this guy on the phone forever, like probably three years. And finally he's like, yeah, you can come up and look at some stuff, I want to get rid of some stuff. And I remember I had to climb through this hole in an attic in his barn and crawl across into a hole to get into his attic of his house. There was so much stuff packed in there. And, and I was, I, I was sleeping in the driveway for like three days in my van. I would always pack the van where I could roll a little bed, roll out in the center of it. And um, the last day, I just like twisted my knee and I tore my ACL. Actually, it was the day before I left. And I went to Walgreens and like bought a cane. <laughs> and I, was, I knew, I was like, if I don't get what I can get, buy what I can buy here now, I'm never going to come back here ever again. So I, I stayed there for like a day and a half with my leg, leg tore out. And, and climbed the ladder with one leg and just kind of drove myself around his attic and got stuff and drove home. And then finally, like, my doctor's like, you gotta have knee surgery, you know? But um, uh, what else did we have? We had raccoons bite us and uh, spider bites. And uh, the thing is with me, like, I'm always, I, I, you, you, you never see animals, but you hear them. You know, right? Like, ah! You're like, oh my God. What is that under there? I don't know what's under there. Yeah, so uh, I think a lot of people always ask us that, like, how do you get bit all the time and stuff like that? But I think <coughs> they're a lot, so much more scared of us than we are of them, you know? So they kind of keep to themselves unless they're, like, cornered. I know last night you guys were out on Long Island, or you were out on Long Island, another signing. Yeah. Did you pick today? No. <laughs> yeah, I did Fox and Friends this morning, and then I went and did an NPR show, radio show, and um, and I was going to do Cup of Joe. A lot of the stuff that I was going to do, it got canceled because of what's going on in Boston. Right. It's just so terrible. And then I was walking to school after Halloween, there were all these pumpkins in the garbage. I'm like, why would people throw those away? <laughs> God, what are they thinking? I went and I got my wagon and I got as many of them as I could and I stuck them in my fort and I was like, oh, these are so cool. I love these. And then after like a week, their faces started caving in and all these bees and everything. And I mean, I was a kid. I didn't know they rotted. You know? So I was always collecting anything and everything. What was the most surprising item that you found? The most unexpected? Surprising item that I found. Oh, there, was a, there was a gentleman that I picked uh, Waukesha, Wisconsin, about 12 years ago, and um, I, I, I called an ad that he ran in like 1965, and I said, do you have any old Harley literature left? He says, do you have Harley literature? He's like, well, yeah, I got it, but, you know, I'll meet you at the bus stop. I'll sell it to you. And I said, okay. So I drove to the bus stop, and, uh, and um, he's like, here it is, and I bought it, and I go, well, do you have anything else? He's like, oh, I got some parts at home, and I said, well, why don't we just go to your house? I go, I don't even have to go in. I'll stand in the driveway. You just bring the parts out, and I'll buy them in the driveway. He's like, all right. So we go to his house, I bought a bunch of parts, and then he's like, I go, why don't you just let me come down to the basement, because he had all this stuff that he couldn't <laughs> carry out, you know, so heavy. And I go, just let me look at it, you know. So we went down there, and I got down to the bottom of the steps, and there was this huge, like, veiny, 
alien head that was like huge, and, I was, and this is in a dark basement, it's just me and this guy, he's like standing really close to me, you know, and I'm like, <laughs> wow, uh, and I go, what is that, and he goes, that's act an actual costume from the movie This Island Earth, which is a huge sci-fi movie, and I go, where did you get it, and he goes, I got it at a prop house in the 60s in Milwaukee, so I um, had shoulder pads, and, like these claw hands and feet, and it was, um, imagine walking down in a dark basement with this like Grizzly Adams looking dude, and and uh, you see that, and uh, I think it was fifty dollars or something. I was like, I'll take it. And it, was, it was all melted. <laughs> it had been down there forever, and, but it was still cool, you know. And that's what I'm t I always talk about: something unusual and different that you haven't seen before, or something that sparks emotion. That was one of those pieces. Um, do people do sometimes people think do some, sometimes No, um, the question is, do people feel insecure about going through the house, what us going through the house? Um, we're usually what happens is, is that they start picking with us. Because they, they're, start, they're starting to see things that they haven't seen in 40, 50 years, and they're like, oh my god, I remember that, I love that. I'm like, how much is it? I'm not selling that, no, I found it. It's laying in the dirt, you know, and they're like, oh, I don't want to sell that, I don't want to rot here. But I love that though. People love that. When they're like, I just love it when people don't sell your stuff. I love that so much. I love it. I love it. And I'm like, I love it too because it shows the relationship. You know, it gives the item a voice, it gives the person a voice, and it shows that relationship. And that's what's so cool about it. That's what's so incredibly amazing about it. Why doesn't the guy want to sell something that's completely rotting into the dirt? He's part of his family, he has an emotional connection to it. And people watch that, and they, they don't understand it, and um, but they want to keep watching it. And I think that's really amazing about the show. You and Frank ever get patted down? <laughs> patted down? <laughs> this is the airport. A garbage man. <laughs> Oh my God, we pick so much stuff. Yeah, we get email all the time. They're like, why didn't you buy that? I'm like, I did buy it. But there's literally, I mean, we'll buy, say I buy 500 things on a property or 200 things. What we do is we, we pick two things out of that property, sometimes three, that are significant to tell a story. You know, because there's two things going on there. There's what I actually do for a living and then there's the entertainment factor of it. But what I actually do for a living is what, what you see me do is what we do. We don't go in, we don't, we don't uh, plant things. We don't do that kind of stuff. I mean, we don't have to plant things. I mean, look at all the stuff that's out there. I mean, when we walk into a building, it's completely full. Does it look like we have to plant anything? You know, I mean. You're still in it. You're really active in this. You are what you Yeah, are. I'm the executive producer of the show. I'm the creator of the show. I've had the business for 11 years. I pitched the show for four and a half years. Now, are there things that we have to do for entertainment factor? Yes, there are. Because if you guys watched me do what I really do for a living, you'd probably turn the channel. You're like, oh, this guy's boring. Like, you know, but there's things that we have to do to uh, to connect stories, like connect picks together. Um, and people are like, "Oh, the show's fake. That's real." Like the guy, was, you went in the door, and the guy was in there with the camera. I'm like, well, no kidding, we're making a television show. <laughs> I told the guy, I'm like, go in there and turn your camera on, because I'm gonna walk in that door. <laughs> Think about that. It's like we have to. You know, you wanted to see the back of my head the whole show? No, we get that to get us coming in. You know, there's things like that we have to do. Okay, what I what? Do it that I have the 20 years.